In this lesson, we're going to be determining whether relations are functions, finding the domain and range of a function, and identifying the independent and dependent variables of functions. So, a relation pairs inputs with outputs. When a relation is given as an ordered pair, the x-coordinates are the inputs and the y-coordinates are the outputs. A relation that pairs each input with exactly one output is a function. So in this one, we're going to determine whether each relation is a function, and then we're going to explain why. So remember, a function is when each input has exactly one output. So for the ordered pairs, for the first example, I see I have negative 2 as an input, negative 1 as an input, 0 as an input, 1 as an input, and 2 as an input. I never have a situation when there's uh, one input going to multiple outputs. So because of that, I know that this is a function. For this one right here, I'm going to do the same thing. I see I have 4 as an input, 8 as an input, 6 as an input, 4 as an input again, so that's a red flag, and then 5 as an input. So let's look at our 4s. Here I have 4 going to 0, but here I have 4 going to 3. Because the input 4 is going to more than one output, this is not a function. And remember, whenever we're dealing with ordered pairs or x and y values, x is almost always the input and y is almost always the output. For part c, I look at my input-output table. I have, for my inputs, negative 2, negative 1, 0, 0 again, 1, and 2. Once again, if you see the same input, uh, th that's a red flag. It might not be a function. So anyway, this 0 goes to 5. This 0 goes to 6. So since, since each input does not go to a unique output, because 0 goes to two different outputs, uh, this is not a function. Last, we have this mapping diagram. Um, so I'll look at my inputs x and my outputs y. So my input, negative 1, goes to 4. 3 goes to 15. 11 goes to 15. Uh, this is fine. This is a function because each input is going to one output. If I had like 11 going to both 15 and 4, then this would not be a function. But since I don't have that, this is a function. And now we're done with this one. So we're going to talk about the vertical line test. A graph represents a function when no vertical line passes through more than one point on the graph. So what you can do, if you have a ruler or a pen or whatever, you can slide it on your paper, and if there's ever a situation on the graph where that vertical line, whether it be a ruler, pen, anything, um, is going through more than one point on that graph, then it is not a function. If it's only going through one point for the entirety of the graph, then it is a function. So if you see here, if you try to have a vertical line at any of these points, there's only going to be one point going through that line. So that means that this, this is a function. Okay, Here, if we slid a vertical line through um, this relation right here, we see at lots of different points, if I have vertical lines, lots of different points, uh, this does not pass the vertical line test. Now, you'll, you, don't, you only need to uh, find one instance where it doesn't pass the vertical line test, but um, in this case, this is not going to be a function because it does not pass the vertical line test. Determine whether each graph represents a function. Explain. Let's look at uh, the graph for part A. So I have all these uh, ordered pairs here, represented as points. And I see actually multiple instances where I have one input that goes to multiple outputs. So that is at x equals 2 and at x equals 5. And if you see, I'm drawing a line through both of these um, points right here. And my points are actually hidden a little bit, so I'll redraw them. But if you can see, at both of these instances, we have points on the on this vertical line. We have multiple points on this vertical line and this one. Uh, so this is not a function because it does not pass the vertical line test. Each input does not go to exactly one output. So this one's not a function. You don't need to draw a line. I would actually recommend using um, a ruler or your pencil uh, just to see whether or not uh, the graph is actually a function. For part B, I, if I did my vertical line test, I see that there's no point, if I had a vertical line, uh, where there'd be multiple points on this graph. So there's only one point vertically for each x value. So I know that this is a function. So 
So I'm on Desmos right now, and I'm gonna show you another instance of the vertical line test. So my blue line is my vertical line, and my red graph is the relation. I wanna to check to see if it's a function. If you see, when I move my vertical line this way, we're fine, but if I move it over here, now this, there, uh, there are multiple points on this function that are going through this vertical line, so this is not a function here. If I move this over here, same. To the left, we're fine, but it's right in this middle part where um, this does not pass the vertical line test. Now I'm gonna try the vertical line test again, and I have my slider, so I'm moving it over. There's still only one uh, Y value for each X value, so there's never two points on this line. So this relation is a function because it does pass the vertical line test. So we're gonna talk about what domain and range of a function is. The domain of a function is the set of all possible input values. The range of a function is the set of all possible output values. So typically, when, we're, when we have x's and y's, x is almost always the input, and y is almost always the output. Therefore, x, whatever possible x values you have, are going to be the domain of that function. And then whatever possible y values you have, that's going to be the range of that function. So always think as domain. as x, all the set of x values that you can have, and then range as y. Find the domain and range of the function represented by the graph. So remember, domain is the possible input values, or in this case, all the possible x values. I'll start right here. I have a negative 3. That's an x value. I have a negative 1 as my x value. I have a 1 as my x value, and then I have a positive 3. So my domain, we typically like to write our uh, domains in numerical order and our range in numerical order from least to greatest. So my lowest value is negative 3, then I have negative 1, then I have 1, and then I have 3. And I'm just putting some uh, braces around here. For the range, my lowest output value for y is negative 2, then I have 0, then I have 2, then I have 4. Negative 2, 0, 2, and 4. So here are the domain and range for part A. For, par for part B, for the range, I have all of the values in between negative 2 for x and then 3 for x. So I'm actually going to write a compound inequality for my domain. So I'll write domain, write my bracket. And then this compound inequality, the lowest value is negative 2, including negative 2. The highest value is positive 3, including positive 3. So I'm going to write negative 2 is less than or equal to x is less than or equal to 3. So this inequality is telling me all of the possible x values for this graph, all the possible input values for this graph. For the range, we're going to do something very similar. I want to write another compound inequality, but this time I'm going for my y values, my output values. So negative 1 is my lowest, and then 2 is my highest value, including both negative 1 and including 2. So I'm going to do negative 1 is less than or equal to y is less than or equal to Two. Remember, domain talks about x values, range talks about y values. So now we're done with this one. The variable that represents the input value of a function is the independent variable, because it can be any value in the domain. The variable that represents the output values of a function is the dependent variable, because it depends on the value of the independent variable. When an equation represents a function, the dependent variable is defined in terms of the independent variable. The statement y is a function of x means that y varies depending on the value of x. So whatever variables alone, which is going to be our output y, depends on the input variable x. So in this equation, we have y equals negative x plus 10. x is the independent variable. y is the dependent variable. The function y equals negative 3x plus 12 represents the amount y in fluid ounces of juice remaining in the bottle after you take x gulps. Identify the independent and dependent variables. So for part A, I want to figure out which one is independent, which one is dependent. 
Um, typically, x is always going to be our independent variable, and y is always going to be our dependent variable. But you could figure that out without knowing that. Okay. So if you if you look at this, we're taking uh, sips or gulps, they say, from the bottle, and of course, after taking a certain number of gulps, the your liquid left in the bottle is going to be dependent on the, how many gulps you take. So naturally, we can figure that out. Uh, but if you see the x and you see the y, you know that the x is almost always going to be independent and y is almost always going to be your dependent variable. So my independent variable is x. My dependent variable is y. For part b, the domain is 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. What is the range? Well, in order to find my range given my domain, I just have to remember my domain are my x values, my input values. So domain is x or input, and then my range is y. So I'm given four different x values 0, 1, 2, and 3. Okay, so here's my x. And then what I can do, and I like to say, what do we do with our Chromebooks tonight? I can plug them in. I can plug these numbers into my function for x to find the y value. Okay? So if I plug in 0, negative 3 times 0 is 0, plus 12, that means that we have 12 fluid ounces to start for my y value. For this one, I plug in 1. Negative 3 times 1 is negative 3, plus 12 is 9. And you might be able to start to see a pattern. For my second gulp, I plug that in. Negative 3 times 2 is negative 6. Negative 6 plus 12 is positive 6. And then 3 for my third gulp, plug it in. Negative 3 times 3 is negative 9 plus 12 is 3. So negative 9 plus 12 is 3. And I forgot to include my 4 in this table. So I plug in 4 back to my function. I'll scroll back up. Negative 3 times 4 is negative 12. Negative 12 plus 12 is 0. So with this y value, I've just found my range. All my possible y values are uh, going to be my range. So I'm just going to write it a little bit nicer. My range. I'm going to write my bracket. And then I, li I do like to do uh, numerical order. So 0. 3, 6, 9, and 12. So this is the range for my function. And now we're done.